Hello everybody, this is Havoc, and welcome back to our tutorial series with Total War Rome Remastered, the series where we take some Total War beginners and walk them through all the basics. In the first few episodes, we've gone over the things like campaign setup and your starting actions that you can do. And in this one, we are going to actually hit the intern button to begin with, and we'll see what is going on and what occurs once you hit that in turn. So we'll go ahead and get right into it today. We'll go through all the administrative things. So we'll do things like queue new buildings, or we'll look at some things. Uh, some factions may pop up. We may even possibly go to war. Uh, odds are what we're going to do is complete this first mission over here in Suggesta, and then we will see what happens after we complete it. We'll, like I said, do some administrative things within your settlements, and uh, hopefully by the end of it, we'll be able to set up a battle so that way the next episode can be focused on battles uh, i hope you are enjoying the series so far if you are please uh feel free to give me a like and a thumbs up subscribe to the channel also if you haven't purchased the game be sure to do so via my nexus gg account last but not least i will continue to stream uh total war rome remastered over on twitch so be sure to check me out there as well but for now let's go ahead and hit the intern and we'll see what happens All right, so Gaul has decided to initiate some diplomacy with us. Uh, now, first and foremost, I want to mention that these diplomatic negotiations can only be instigated via a diplomat. Unlike in newer Total Wars, you don't have the diplomacy screen where you can talk to anyone halfway across the world. Uh, you have to have a diplomat negotiate with a character and or a settlement of the faction you are wanting to initiate diplomatic negotiations with. And right here, you can see they're offering us trade routes. So as I mentioned before, trade naturally occurs between neighboring settlements. So for us, we are actually already trading with Gaul, but this initiates actual trade rights where we are saying, hey, we are officially and purposefully negotiating trade. Now we'll get to what that means in just a little bit, but there is a lot to look over here. Uh, first off, he has initiated diplomacy with our faction heir. You can negotiate diplomacy with anyone, really, but this just gives you the different negotiating skills and or just the stats of the person that is in the uh, negotiating table. Right here, uh, our diplomat, Synaculus of Savus, age 28. So we don't know anything about him, so we don't know any kind of negotiation schemes he might be having. This does give us a little bit of a layout underneath here. As you can see, we are allied with the Brutii, the Scipii, and the Senate. They are allied with no one, at least so far as we know. And uh, they are only enemies with the rebels, just like us. Now, below our faction icons, you have your reputation. Your reputation is essentially the trustworthiness of newer Total War games. So as you see, we have a reputation of 80, which means we, uh, we are decently trustworthy. Whatever we say we're going to do, we will be able to do it. And there's a, a not a likely chance that uh, they'll stab us in the back. At least that's what the AI is seeing. Now, of course, what we see is the exact same thing. Gaul has a, a not likelihood of declaring war on us because they have a high reputation. So if they're offering trade rights, it's a fairly good indication that they don't mean anything nefarious at the moment. But you can see here, we have been neutral for zero turns. Obviously, the game has just started. And uh, so our relationship hasn't been developed either. Now, if we were to do trade rights, the relationship would go up. The longer we have trade rights or any other peaceful negotiations, the uh, higher the or the relationship goes up. Uh, and then, of course, if we were to break that, our relationship would go down and our reputation would go down as well. So you want to be kind of careful about uh, what you do when breaking contracts or breaking things. And then uh, strength comparison. This says that the Gauls are decently bigger than us. If this is your first time playing, you don't know this, but Gaul owns much of Gaul, <laughs> uh, modern-day France. So naturally, they do have more troops than we do. They probably have maybe not so much a stronger economy, but they have more things that can affect it. So naturally, they are going to have a higher strength comparison. So again, they want trade rights. Now, we could accept it by hitting the green button. We could just flat-out decline the entire proposal. Or we could make a counter offer. If we're like, okay, well, we'll do trade rights, but we want this. This is where your negotiating comes in. 
Now we have the availability to do all of this with our own diplomat, but I want to show you as a counter offer what we could do. Right now, the proposal balance is balanced, meaning that there is uh, the likelihood that they will always accept. If they don't, they may ask for a little bit of money or maybe map information or something. But right now, they are offering us trade rights. The proposal balance is balanced, so we could accept this, wash our hands of it, and be done. We're not going to do that because I don't like trade rights uh, for them right now. But what we can do is offer and or request pretty much the exact same things. We can offer an alliance, which means we are allied with Gaul, which means we will have a natural inclination to go to war and or support them, either in a defensive or offensive war. We definitely want to do that. That's reserved for very, very close relationship troops. <laughs> very close. Um, and in fact, I don't even want to do this for these guys. Just being completely frank, because I don't like the other factions. Uh, we could do trade rights, as I said. It boosts trade with gold. We can offer to attack a faction. So we can say, hey, um, and again, this is a negotiation, remember. So we could be like, hey, uh, give us this, this, and this, and we'll go to war. Uh, I know a neighbor is Germania. Or we'll go to war with Britannia, if that's the case. Uh, they may accept that. That may be, you know, very, very uh, a good incentive for them to do. Uh, but let's let's not do that. I don't want to end negotiations either. So we'll just uh, click on that to remove it. We can offer to give a region. Right now, our only region is Ariminum. Uh, and as you can see, the balance becomes very generous. Of course it does, because it's a huge settlement. But if you are nearing the end of a war, for instance, say we were to go to war with Gaul, and they were just getting wrecked, but we were also getting kind of wore out. I wanted to move on and do other things, but they come at me with a peace agreement. I can be like, okay, well... If you want to, you can give me, and we'll do this in the request, but you could give me Patavium or Lamanum or Condate Radonum. Of course, that is very demanding now, but you get my you get my meaning. Um, so that's what the give region is for. We can offer a single payment of any amount. Well, you can. Oh, sweet. We could offer 500,000 denarii. Of course, we don't have that. Uh, or we could offer regular tribute, which says, hey, I'll give you 200 for five turns instead of a thousand right up front because I can't afford it. So it's a really good, uh, really good negotiating schemes right there. And then of course you can always offer map information. This map information will quite literally just give them uh, share information on territories that Gaul has not scouted. So uh, if we were to give them our map information, they would be able to see. I can't bring it down. They'd be able to see the locations of the Julia or the Scipii and the Bertii, and the Roman Senate. The same goes the other way around, though. We can request, if we were to say, hey, we'll give you our maps if you offer to attack Britannia, for whatever reason. They could accept or deny that. They can give a reason or region. They can give a single payment. They can give regular tribute and map information. Uh, and then, of course, we could cancel all trade with Gaul. So this would be like, hey, by the way, uh, we're not doing anything with you guys. We are, we are, that's a pretty good declaration of war without declaring war. Uh, just to be like, hey, I want to financially strap you so you can't do the things you need to do. For us, what we're going to try to do is we are going to try to get map information for map information. Uh, I don't mind revealing all the locations of my buddies down south. Gaul, I don't know anything about. So it would actually benefit us more. Now, again, this is balanced, so they could come back with a counter proposal to our counter proposal with money or other things like that. So let's try and do that. Let's see. Let's just see what happens. All right. So they are basically saying, we will give you trade rights. We will give you map information. If you give us 540 denarii and your maps, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that at all. I don't want trade rights with Gaul. We will probably end up going to war with Gaul. And I don't want to ruin that reputation. Most people wouldn't. I should say. Uh, most Total War beginners, this is probably not something you want to offer up. Uh, what we are going to do, however, is I'm going to counter that counter of the counter. And we will say, hey, you know what? You are going to offer trade rights. We will get, or we will do trade rights. We will give you 540 bucks if uh, you give us your maps. Let's see if they do that. Awesome. So we lost 540 bucks. <sighs> It probably was the smartest thing, but I did just want to show you what we could do. And then we could go back in 
and we could you know say hey request a single payment or we could uh cancel trade rights and then do a trade embargo uh so that's just something that we can do kind of give you an overview of the diplomatic negotiations that are possible we can get into some more complicated things later on but uh that will that's a pretty good summation of it and we still end up with some decent money uh, so if we go here we have no alerts we do have news the SPQR and the House of Scipii are at war with the Greek cities. Now, if we didn't really care about that, we could always say, hey, I just, I, I read it. Okay, cool. Or we could even disable or delete all the messages. So, or you can even delete individual ones with the scroll here. So, okay, look, no more news. Cool. Uh, we hit, unfortunately, mark all messages as read. Goes through everything. So, those reports, we did have two reports, but it said that we didn't because we practically read it. Now, your recruitment report basically says, hey, in uh, the spring or winter, excuse me, of 270 BC, turn two, Aretium and Arimnum both completed town watches. And because we have an additional recruitment that we initiated, it is going to give us that say, hey, by the way, you do have two other things. This is really, really handy because in the later games, when you have a whole lot of settlements or you're focusing on certain regions with recruitment, it's nice to look at this report and be like, oh, okay, well, Aretium doesn't have another unit, so it's going to say nothing is queued. I should probably do that. Or you completed construction in this settlement, but there's nothing queued, so you should probably go do something. It's just a really good way to keep an eye on things. And then we have, have our intern report. Basically says, hey, we lost two and a half grand. Sort of, yes, we spent two and a half grand uh, more than what we were bringing in. And then finally, we have Suggesta, which we could take. We have 10 turns or nine turns, excuse me. We're going to leave this here because remember, once Suggesta at the end of this turn, once they come or once that intern is over with, I'm all over the place today, uh, we will automatically gain that without a fight. So we're not going to do that. Like I mentioned, we're going to get into battles in a little bit. And this is the perfect reason why a few things are happening on this map. You can see Gaul sent their diplomat, Senate sent their diplomat, wherever they're going to go. Uh, we have our boy that we can move over there, but Gaul has also moved. They moved around quite a bit, actually. So we have an army, Captain Tenko Gisla. Now, we don't know very much about him because we're not close enough and or we don't have the, the subterfuge or the intrigue to do so. We do know that they have a unit of barbarian cavalry. Now, this will say, hey, there's 108 soldiers that are supposed to be in it. We don't know, hence the question mark right there, uh, but we do know that they would cost 90 gold. And then we have two unknown unit types because we're not close enough again. We don't have all that information. We come over to here and we see that Lugo Torix is a two-star general. He is uh, creeping up at the border, which isn't uncommon, I should say. Doesn't mean it's necessarily in a declaration of war, but it could be. They just don't want to do it just yet. But we can see all of his stats as much as possible. And then we can see down here, if we clicked on him, we could see any traits, any followers, if we knew any. Bribery resistance. So that means that he is going to be harder to bribe as diplomats. We can bribe any individual army or any individual city if we so desired, which is super handy to do. What we can see here, he does have a full unit of Barbarian Cav. He has a full unit of Warband. He has another unit of Warband and a Skirmisher Warband as well. So it'll be safe to say that he probably does have a full uh, full army, full recruitment uh, units in there. It is the beginning of the game. Another interesting that is, thing that has popped up is Captain Lysimachos. Now, again, we don't know anything about him because we don't have anyone to go check him out. These rebels will pop up uh, in your settlements sort of frequent, frequently. Uh, it's not constant. But what typically happens is that these units are relatively easy to conquer. They are kind of designed to give your troops a little bit of a bonus, maybe encourage one of your commanders to get a trait or a follower. And you'll see these guys with uh, with merchants as well. Merchants are supposed to be, rebel merchants are supposed to be super easy to buy out. So it is just meant as a kind of free experience booster, if you want to call it that. But if left untouched, this army will grow larger and larger. So we want to take care of it as quickly as possible. So what we're going to do is we are going to move uh, Flavius Julius over as far as he can. We can left click to speed that up. 
Now we have 736 units in this army. There's 560, so fair chance we've got a decent amount. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my two units of Hastati. If you hold down shift and click, you'll be able to click multiples in a row. So as you see, if I click over there, it'll click on a row. Or if you hold down control, you can select individual ones. So we're going to select the two units of Hastati. I'm going to bring it over here again, merging by left clicking on the army. And now we have a total of 1,056. Uh, we'll be able to take this guy on in the next episode and that's in fact what we are going to do for our battle so keep a heads up for that one. now as we can see here we did move some troops out so our public order happiness isn't exactly stellar but it's sufficient i'm not gonna i'm not gonna mess with it uh and then we can see here that we have two turns left for paved roads we are still making a, another unit of town watch if i were to click that off just by left clicking you'll see that not only is it disappeared from the queue but we also got some money back so again, just kind of quality of life heads up. We are going to do another unit of Town Watch. And I may even go for some Hestati. Nah, we won't worry about it. We'll wait. Uh, and then over here, we are working on two units. So we will only do one more unit here because we're okay. I'm going to do that. Again, that goes up. Cool beans, cool beans. I really like that. Now, what else can we do? Well, we can move our Diplomat. Your so what I'm going to try and do and hopefully this works, is that I'm gonna to go to Captain Tenkong Gisla and see if we can bribe him. He has a captain after all. All right, so as you can see, our typical information is here, but we have a private dealing because these private dealings, let's see if it does it. All right, so we can attempt to bribe Captain Tenkong Gisla to join your faction or disband their army. So if we did this, we would bribe them. The entire army will disband and return to the field. Name your price. So he wouldn't join our army. He would simply disband. But again, if you have the ability to bribe someone, that'll give you just one little bit leg up against someone like the Gauls. So let's do this. All right. We are not simple-minded. Our honor and friendship are not cheap goods for sale in a market. No, not even for your gold. So they won't go for it. We can do the same thing for a settlement, uh, usually. I'm not enti entirely sure why we can't. Maybe because the faction heir is the lead of it. But I do believe that you can bribe entire settlements, so that's unfortunate. But if we did move closer, we can see that they only have one unit, their faction heir, and they don't have a whole lot of troops there. Uh, we're going to keep our spy right here, actually. And the reason being... We're actually going to go see if he can get some information. Did it work? Spying mission success. Awesome. Been successful in his mission. And there you will see we can find out, hopefully find out any traits that he has. So he just has bribery resistance. And here we go. Some traits. He's intelligent. He has a two to influence command and management. He's stern which gives him another role of management, 100% increase to cost to bribe. And then he has a civilized slave, which gives him another management key. So he is a pretty good governor. Not so great of a general, which we could probably use that to our advantage. And then you can see the full unit numbers are fleshed out because we spied on that. But we're going to move here. We're going to see what Rome has in store for us. Um, after we take Suggesto. But one of the things, I am a terrible tutorial guide, because one thing I forgot to mention in our diplomatic relations with the Gauls is that they did, in fact, give us map information. <laughs> so you can see here, they have updated uh, their territory. So they have five other territories, which makes Rome look rather small in comparison. So I apologize for forgetting on that, but if we were to zoom in into the regular campaign map, We'd be able to see the locations. Now, we don't know very much. We get a glance from that, the uh, potential for settlement walls and things of that nature, which can be somewhat easily seen. Can't even see that, really. And then you can see here that this is their capital because, again, it has the uh, leaves on the edges. And again, we could send an agent. It would take four turns for both of these boyos to get over to Alicia. But now we have a point of reference if we go to war. We know, okay, this is their capital. 
All right, this is a minor settlement. This is a town, etc., etc. And we'd have to go all the way over to here, which is not fun. Zigzagging all the way across to Spain. So we know they may hold out in New Mancha if we were to go to war with them. I always try to get map information, just as a, a personal aside. I always try to get map information, and I am always more than willing to sacrifice my own because it doesn't matter that much to me if the enemy know where my settlements are. But I really, really, really want to know where theirs are so we can get an idea on where to go and how to conquer. All right. Well, we've pretty much done everything that we can do with this turn. We're going to hit the end turn again. At the beginning of the game, there's not going to be a whole lot for you to do. You're not going to have a ton of money. I don't recommend spending a whole bunch of money constantly to where you have no money at the end of your turn. Simply because later in the game, you're going to want to save up for those higher tier buildings. And as you can see right here, we're going to have uh, we're going to have at least one building. We'll take this over, so we'll probably have at least two buildings to build next turn. So I want to have some money. At the moment, we're only making 540 as a positive income. Uh, but one thing I forgot to do, uh, it is in the faction summary. That's right. We can see here that our recruitment, we have initiated recruitment for this turn. There is technically no construction for this turn because we have initiated it in another turn. So it's still going to show that these two buildings were constructed for 1080 and 760, but it actually doesn't show that we spent any money to this turn because technically we didn't. However, we are dropping 150 buckaroonies on two town watch. Uh, so yeah, just want to do that. Let's hit the intern again. Awesome. So we took Suggesta without a fight. Settlement has fallen to the might of your army. Victory is yours and the fate of the settlement lies in your hands. So we have three options when we take any settlement. We can occupy it, in which case we gain a little bit of loot, but everyone stays intact. This is really, really good to do at the very beginning of your game because you want those smaller settlements, especially the rebel ones, you want them to have somewhat of a population. So that way it doesn't take so long to get them leveled up. Otherwise, you're going to have several settlements where they aren't doing anything for a long, long time because they don't have a good population. Later in the game or for bigger cities that you get in the future, enslaving and exterminating is a, a very legitimate option. All right, so we uh, occupying is just looting, but no one dies. Enslaving, we gain a little bit of loot, but we disperse a good portion of the population among the settlements as uh, slaves, essentially. Uh, so this is a little bit riskier i'm honestly not sure when you'd want to do this i don't favor it because it boosts the population of my settlements up too quickly and what you end up having is a bunch of settlements that need leveling up constantly because you're constantly enslaving them i don't agree with it necessarily unless you just want to boost to get into the late game a little faster which i could understand but as total war beginners i would do not recommend enslaving your fact or your settlements for the time being and then exterminate. Exterminate means a lot of people get killed. Just straight up killed, not even enslaved. But you do get the most money out of it. So exterminating is good for larger settlements. Or for places where you just don't want to deal with it, basically. <laughs> uh, this is very similar to, to like a, a loot and occupy kind of scenario. So we are going to occupy it. The settlement is now ours. And as you can see here. Our Senate mission is successful, and we've been granted a gift of 5,000 denarii. That's over here. So we now have nearly eight grand, which is really, really nice. We go down here to news. War declared. The Broody Eye are now at war with the Greek cities. And then, here's what I was talking about. Recruitment report. Aretium and Ariminum have both created their town watch, but there is no unit feud. So that's something we'll need to keep in mind of. Ariminum also has uh, its port completed, and no building has been queued. And then we have our positive income and expenses. Uh, we also have a new Senate mission. These will pretty much trigger every time uh, after your first one has been completed. You'll never have more than one, but there will always be a Senate mission. Now, this Senate mission is to take Corrales, which is to our south. We require a Navy, which we have a Navy, which is pretty decent. But it would also mean we are directly going to war with Carthage for a minor settlement a very small settlement in the middle of nowhere. I'm not going to do that. Again, Senate missions are optional. It's good if you do them, but if it doesn't fit your progression or you don't you really don't feel like doing it, then don't do it. It's not going to kill you. So you can see we have 10 turns to do it. We're not going to do it. 
Now onto the campaign map. You can see that the uh, Luke Odorix has been moving into our territory. This is a pretty blatant act of aggression. Very blatant, honestly. Uh, they will probably go to war with us. Now, in their fairness, this was a rebel settlement the last turn. And I don't know that they actually were able to see that it was a settlement that was besieged by us. So it could be an error. They could have tried to get here in time. But regardless, they have now crossed into our territory. And I don't agree with it. Let's see if we can bribe them again just for kicks and giggles. Okay, so Captain Tango Gisla will, uh, if we give them 5,355 denarii, then they will do it. We're not going to do it. I just wanted to see if it was even possible. And now what we are going to do is we are going to move our diplomat this way. Because if we go into the map overview, we can also see that there's Germania right there, Britannia right there. So we can go that direction. And then a uh, tiny little sliver of Galicia for Gaul or for Spain. So uh, what we can do is Spain's going to be around here. Germania is going to be up there. Britannia is going to be up that away. And those are the only factions we technically know about aside from like the Greek cities in Carthage. Uh, so that's potential plans for expansion. Something we can consider if we want to. Uh, but we don't have to. But I am moving my sure. diplomat over that way. And then let's see. Patavium has 2,700 people. Can I move my scout closer? They have 2,600 people. Let's go with uh, Mediolanum. Spying mission was a success. Awesome. So now our spy is in here. There are no other faction agents. We could have a ton of agents in here. We might get to why we would do that in a little bit, but whatever. Uh, and then you can see we can send our spy in different areas as well. I don't know if I pointed this out with the last episode. I honestly can't remember. But it is a really cool feature uh, that we might utilize in the future. We can see they, ha they have a Warlord's Hold, a Wooden Palisade, and Muster Fields. And then in terms of units, they have a Warband and a Poridorix, which is the faction heir. And then again, that captain has two units of Spear or Warbands, one unit of Barbarian Cavalry. Now, again, not much else that we can do for this turn. We have four units here. I'm actually completely okay with that. And let's move one of these guys over to here. There we go. That levels it out a bit more. We have the ability to take on the captain, the rebel captain. We'll do that in the next episode, though. But we'll see here. We are we are missing uh, recruited troops, so we can also uh, so we can build a Hastati, which would probably be the best case scenario for us at the moment. Gives us our core infantry group. We don't have any need for a Byreem, which is the naval units over here. Not at the moment. Uh, we don't need a diplomat really, because we could go exploring this way, but I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, let's get two units of Hestati rolling, so we don't have to worry about it. And then over here in Ariminum, you can see that we still don't have the ability to build Hestati. But we did build the port. So if we look at our port, it is constructed. You'll also notice that unlike Aretium, we don't have a seaport yet. That's because our fastest way is Tarentum over land. And we don't have any trade rights established with any of these other factions. Uh, so if that were to happen, then you would see a trade route come in out there. So keep your uh, keep an eye on that as well. And then we need to do something for Ariminum. And we could do a wide range of things as we talked about last time. Uh, in terms of economic value, we have our trader, which doesn't do much. We have our roads, which will do probably the most. They do indeed the most but it would be nice to keep these guys building troops but i don't want town watch and i also don't want to keep pumping out just a study so i think for this this settlement we're going to do a stables it allows us to build equites and war dogs which i think would be very very helpful for us to diversify our army makeup and then lastly suggesta suggesta is uh, again a rebel it was a rebel settlement it's not going to have anything in it. That's just kind of the deal with some of these rebel settlements at the start. So we only have one option to build, and that's a governor's house. We don't even have the option to build a unit because the governor's house allows us to build peasants. So we have to build this before we can even do anything else. Uh, we can't even build walls. We can't do any of that stuff. And then I'm going to drop this down to low. And the reason being 
If we were at normal, you can see our percentage rate is only at 2% for growth. I want to do that as fast as we can. I want to try to get, uh, what would it be, a thousand? No, it'd probably be, I think it's 2,000 or something like that to upgrade. Let's look here. A large town is 2,000. Also, FYI, this is something I also missed, your building browser. It's next to your build recruitment and build construction. Your building browser will allow you to see all of the current buildings within your own faction, which is super, super handy. Super, super handy to uh, remember. So you can see right there, large town takes 2,000 people. So we want to try and, and influence that as much as possible. All right, guys. Well, I think I've rambled on long enough. As you can see here, we have the ability to take on Captain Lissimakos. And we'll do that with the next episode so I can show you the basics of battles as, well, as efficiently as possible, I suppose. Uh, so guys, that will be the end of this episode going over the first couple of turns and the, your kind of starting things that you can do, starting things that you need to be concerned about and all of those other things, kind of some basic overview of some agent actions and then some administration within your settlement. Hope you enjoyed it, guys. If you did, be sure to give it that thumbs up, give it the like, the comment, and the subscription. Be sure to check out my Nexus GG store to pre-purchase the game and also to check out my Twitch for live content. This is Havoc, and I will see you all in the next tutorial.